Hi, I'm Mehdi Sandaji, and welcome to Your Finance TV's Crypto Revolution, covering all things crypto and digital assets. There's always a lot to talk about in this world of crypto and digital assets. Adam, welcome back, mate. Good to be back, man. As you said, always something to talk about, and this has not been a slow week so far. It's funny, you know, we kind of look at the price of Bitcoin, for example, and it's been a very stable asset of late. Um, but the news flow keeps coming in, you know, fast and furious. So there's definitely always something to talk about. And Adam, before we get in, viewers, don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to stay on top of our content. There's always something to talk about, and we're happy to talk about topics you want us to explore. So hit us up, let us know what interests you, and uh, we'll dive deeper into it for you. Um, like subscribe we're at 3500 subscribers now so uh, you know thank you for your support and keep on plugging adam um so you know what let's pick on revolut there it's a bit of a negative story i guess uh, that we're kicking off with but they are looking at uh, well they're, they're not looking at they're going to shut down the crypto business in the us and it's the same news as always um citing us regulatory lack of clarity and uh, onwards and upwards they go Right. They're, you know, among several other companies that have decided to shut down, you know, crypto trading or crypto onboarding in the U.S. Uh, amidst the regulatory, the, the lack of regulatory clarity. Now, what you cited, Revolut is a big company in Europe, right? They, they do quite a bit of business in Europe. They're obviously big fintech. So what they're doing is they're not a bank, but they, they kind of have an app and they have applications and technology that will kind of connect you to your banks or your bank and allow you to have banking type services, but that they look really cool, like right? they look really new and fresh and, and updated uh, on top of those old banking rails that you and I talk about quite a bit in here, you know, in crypto revolution. So with, you know, Revolut, I think looking at the US, they're going, look, it's not worth a fight. It's it, At this point, without that clarity, uh, we probably don't make enough money from people onboarding into crypto. Our bread and butter is being a fintech company is helping people get onto those banking rails. And we don't want to get sued by the SEC. Let's let Coinbase and Ripple and all of them fight their fight and spend their hundreds of millions of dollars on lawyers. We'll keep doing what we do. We don't they, they basically uh, they don't want to upset the main part of their business. And, and we've seen this in several other companies, right, that have just said, look, it's not worth it for us to upset all this other business we have to try to get this tiny sliver that is crypto. And once Coinbase and, and the SEC have settled or Ripple or whatever, or maybe we have, you know, a new regime in the SEC or, you know, new executive branch or something like that, or even actual new legislation in the U.S., my gosh, wouldn't that be novel? Then we're ready to come back in. It's really easy for them to, to all of a sudden flip it on and go, guess what? Now we're offering crypto again. But in the meantime, they don't have to worry about getting sued. I completely agree with you. I think it is a matter of just, it's just not worth it. The, the headaches outweigh the benefits and, and the, the revenue stream that they would get from this. It just isn't worth it. And again, this just continues to nail that point home. There was another article about how Asia is flourishing in this world of crypto and digital assets because they're regulator friendly. Not even It's not even about getting friendly terms from regulators and legislatures or you know the, the government bodies. It's about getting something that allows people to invest within a structured environment in this in this environment, right? And that's what's lacking for us. Exactly. And and it's a lot, it, it's it's about, and I know we usually talk about kind of regulation next, but if you look at places like Switzerland, where where their regulations are very technology agnostic, an asset is an asset. Here's how it fits into our in, into our banking structure and our banking regulations, regardless of what asset it is. And it seems like the U.S. has not taken that stance of an asset is an asset, regardless of, of how it looks. So, you know, while we're looking at, uh, I don't want to get too deep into the regulation side, but, uh, you know, before we do get into that, we've talked about WorldCoin and Sam Altman's, you know, brainchild here uh, last couple of weeks on and off. And they had actually launched in Kenya, or you'd say maybe Kenya. Um, I grew up saying Kenya, so I don't know. Um, but, uh, that, you know, for an African, African country, they're actually a very uh, tech-forward country. Mm -hmm. WorldCoin was, you know, set up there, and they were actually shut down um, for Kenyan government citing security uh, issues, concerns. 
You're uh, not a huge fan of this, um, so I'd love to hear your take on this. I'm I'm not a big fan at all. It's you know kind of a, a little bit of what we thought. Now you know what happened was the the government in Nairobi went and sh- not only shut down World Coin there, shut down the basically they had these places where where they'd opened up and they had the orbs out and they were scanning people's irises, and of course they got people in you know Africa and the less developed countries to do this. Uh, they, they even did it in, you know, kind of Central Europe. And they got them to do this by promising them world coins. They're basically bribing people to come scan their iris so that they can get a little bit of crypto in their wallet. Now, when when the government there in Nairobi came in and kind of, um, I guess, came, came into the offices, raided the offices, I guess, they actually took a bunch of those orb devices. Now, WorldCoin has said, look, we don't store data on those. They're not going to be able to get anyone's data. But this is exactly what we were worried about, right? Like once you tie a, you know, a very big company, an actual company to what they say is a decentralized database or a decentralized ledger, and you have actual devices scanning information about people and putting them in there, you're going to have governments that see that as attractive. You're going to have organizations that are not governments that see that as attractive, right? Maybe we can get that data on all these people and really track what they're doing, follow what they're doing. And in Kenya, they actually cited as a security risk, actually the government saying, we don't want our people to do this. We don't feel comfortable with our people putting this information out there on a public blockchain and we're going to take it. But then you go, all right, in whose hands is that data? In whose hands are those devices? Can they reverse engineer something and get that information? This is exactly what we thought, you know, kind of thought would happen. But from the negative, this is exactly what we don't want to happen. Right. This is this is where public blockchains and this idea of public ledgers with the added layer of privacy, meaning I have to have my wallet to interact with it. This is where we don't want it to go. We do not want it to go into the hands of government that can now track everything we do. And so, you know, what WorldCoin did, it, it, it's funny. It was like almost what week two or something they were doing this. And immediately we see one of these these negative headlines. I'm still incredibly not impressed with WorldCoin. Uh, nor I, I think are a lot of people impressed. And it's interesting that there's already a, a government in the in the world that said, we're not impressed either. We don't like this to the point that we're going to take your round devices that scan irises. All right. So still, I, I love the thought of technology. I don't, I completely agree with you on, on ultimately what's happening with the information that's on there. But uh, yeah, we'll see how this story develops and see what the implications are for the rollout on a, on a bigger, larger scale basis right. for um, Altman and his uh, world coin. So um, going on to the regulatory side, even though we already spent half of our conversation on it, um, there was actually a pretty good white paper or or thought piece from uh, Matt Walsh. He's the founder at uh, Castle Island Ventures. Uh, They invest in a lot of uh, uh, US-based startups on the crypto world and digital assets side. But he was highlighting that uh, the argument he put forward was that Congress should set US digital asset policy, not the SEC. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because you know I'm kind of in line to agreeing with a lot of what he's saying because the SEC just comes across as as almost being an unbiased participant in this whole um, situation, and that's not really what you want in that seat to uh, you know putting together asset policy uh, policy in this case. Exactly, and and I think Matt Walsh is right. Th- this is an, an area where it's new enough and it's big enough and it touches enough parts that Congress should be the ones enacting new rules. Because remember, the SEC is just a regulator. Their job is to look at the rules that are in place and say, is is what Adam is doing or is what Coinbase is doing or is what this particular financial advisor doing, does that fit with the rules that Congress put in place? And, and yes, the SEC gets to somewhat interpret them a certain way, but then they can always be taken to court and say, and, and the court can say, look, the SEC, what you're doing doesn't fit what Congress charged you with, right? So in in this case, the SEC has basically said, we have our set of rules and we think crypto fits within what we're supposed to regulate. And in so doing, they they are not checking the boxes. They are not doing what they're supposed to do. And therefore we're going to sue Coinbase and Ripple and Binance and all these other companies for things that we think they're doing that that are violating what Congress has told us. And what Matt Walsh is saying is, look, 
this this is new enough and big enough that Congress is, should be stepping in and enacting new laws. The SEC should not be putting in new regulations that they think fit the old laws, knowing full well that the regulations they're putting in are basically trying to wipe crypto out of the U.S. So you've thrown Coinbase in there a few times, and um, Coinbase's latest argument with the SEC is that the lawsuit should be dismissed based on the fact that they don't trade securities. Going through, obviously I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legal expert in any way, shape or form, but I went through a lot of their documents and uh, it seems like they have a lot of merit in what they're saying here against uh, the defense, oh sorry, for their defense against the SEC lawsuit. What do you think? And I think their defense is, look, there was just a court case where the judge said that, you know, XRP in particular, it, when it's on this exchange in this particular form, is not a security. They, it, it, they basically said tokens can be securities in some instances, and they are not securities in other instances. And Coinbase is basically saying everything we have listed is the same as XRP in that instance that the judge says it is not a security. And therefore, you have SEC, you have absolutely no merit for this lawsuit, and we're asking it to be dismissed. I think it's kind of a Hail Mary because I don't think there's a judge that's going to go, all right, this is a monster lawsuit from a huge regulator in the, in America, and we're just going to throw it out. I, I don't see that happening. But I think with the XRP decision, there are some chinks in the armor there with the SEC and Coinbase is just trying to put a few more, put a few more doubts. And maybe the judge will say something. Maybe they won't say we're going to throw it out, but something that will stand up later that, that they can use. Just like when there were preliminary hearings between the SEC and Coinbase, the, the judge basically was, it seemed like was kind of siding with Coinbase and saying, we, we get, you know, based on this XRP ruling, we kind of get that. Hey, SEC, how did you let them go be a public company? Their business model hasn't changed. So you, the SEC, are essentially, you are not protecting investors at all because you let a business that's now worth however many billions of dollars exist. And now you're telling us that everything they're doing is illegal. Imagine how much wealth is going to be destroyed. So already there are just these little chinks in the armor of the SEC that we didn't think would ever happen. And they're happening. And Coinbase is just playing offense right now. They are just going full bore saying, we don't think there should be a suit at all. Well, it's funny because you kind of nailed it there and the fact that it's very difficult for a judge to turn around and give a blanket ruling saying that this is just like XRP when there's thousands of securities that need to be kind of put into different buckets or how they're going to be classified. And and the fact is that you're absolutely right. This is The SEC is going to ultimately end up with egg on their face one way or the other because either they've, you know, they've allowed a company to go public and they right. are now trying to fight what they're doing, but nothing has changed. So it's, it's a ridiculous situation. And the SEC just keeps digging themselves in a deeper hole. So we'll definitely yep. see how this all pans out. Yep. And, and remember, they recently went back and asked Congress for more money so that they could fight this. Right. So they're digging themselves a hole and they're asking for, you know, kind of for Congress to fund more dirt for the hole. It'd be great if Congress decided to pay them in WellCoin. <laughs> I, I had not thought of that, but that would be amazing. Like, hey, Gary. <laughs> Go scan your eyeballs, uh, and, and that's where your money's coming from. And that's where your money's coming from. That'd be awesome. Gary sitting there with his wallet trying to figure it all out. Um, before we uh, get too sucked into the regulatory side of things, let's jump on some applications with something more interesting and exciting than uh, the boring uh, regulatory side. PayPal, um, one of our old buddies, they've launched a stable coin on Ethereum, and uh, they're making an active shift towards digital currencies. They partnered with Paxos. Uh, this is a great, you know, it's a, a pretty smart and logical move by them, right? They, they, you've got all the balances sitting in PayPal rather than them you know, being converted into crypto of choice. Have your own native stable coin that you can keep sitting there and, and people can earn and you can utilize that for payments within the universe. So it's, it's great. I think this is a phenomenal idea and, and I'm sure this has been on their books for a while. I think it's a great idea. And look, you can look at the history of PayPal and crypto, right? Where originally they said, this is nothing. We don't like it. Uh, it's not going to work. It's a scam. And then a couple of years ago, they went and said, okay, if you have a PayPal account, you can actually buy crypto within your PayPal account, uh, which the, the crypto people got all excited about. I was not excited about it. I said, look, they, they basically just created a stable coin called PayPal USD, right? And this was a few years ago. 
then they they said, okay, now you can buy crypto and actually take it out of your account and move it to a wallet. And now what they've done is they've launched a stable coin. And here's why this is this is exciting for me. And, and you mentioned Paxos is the one. Paxos, part of their business is they kind of create white label stable coins. They were made famous because they were the ones handling the Binance USD. They handled the Binance stable coin. And of course, that got pulled by the, the New York uh, Department of Financial Services. Um, and now they're kind of doing the same thing for PayPal, which I think is even bigger. You know, much bigger. So the some important things to note, Medi, because because there's a lot to unpack here. We could have done a whole show on this, but it is PayPal going. Look, we're not going to bury our heads in the sand. We're not going to sit here like a lot of other companies are doing and fight crypto and go. You shouldn't use this. You know, it's not going to happen. You need to use banking rails. PayPal is going. No, this might one. This might eat into our business, and it probably already is. And two. Why would we not want to be on that train? If we think it's going to be profitable, if we think it's going to be a big deal, PayPal is not necessarily about connecting you and I via our banks. PayPal is about you and I being able to transact financially. We can transact financially with an app that connects our banks, much like Revolut does, or we can connect financially via this global decentralized ledger and we're going to have a stable coin on. So PayPal is going, look, we're going to run an end around around. Uh, we're, we're not going to let people use USDC or DAI or one of those other stable coins. You just use ours. And by the way, you can use it if you have a PayPal account and you can take it off of our exchange. So we, we're going to see PayPal USD exist on Ethereum outside of PayPal accounts. And PayPal has likely figured out a way to go, we're going to provide the wallets or, or something else, or we're going to have some sort of fees if you want to use our stable coin to, to be able to transact business or something like that. They're going to have some way they're going to use this. But as PayPal realizing what their real business is, and their business is you and I can either send money to each other, just somehow transact financially, no matter what the back end is, no matter what the currency is. Right. And that's that's a really interesting and important stance to me. And I'll stop for a second because I got more to talk about, but I'll, I'll let you jump in. No, I, th I completely agree with you. And, 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 you know, it's kind of amazing that. Well, I guess they've probably been hashing things out internally before they got here, but this is a perfect kind of use case for what their existing business was. They see the opportunity on a global basis, and they've now put things into action. So I have nothing negative to say about this. I think this is all positive. I think this is a almost like one of those um, university use cases that you can people will be talking about in, in years to come on how this evolution has come to be to where they are or will be in the next 10, 20 years. And I think PayPal has done it really right. I, I think they have so far. So a couple other things real quickly on the if we go back you know up to the regulatory side, right? This to me is the equivalent in, in regulation of stable coins as the BlackRock ETF filings was for ETFs and, and the acceptance of, of crypto as something that ends up being SEC registered, right? Or, or SEC approved. Because PayPal is a behemoth. It's a monster public company that has an unbelievable amount of money. And it's kind of PayPal looking at Congress and, and looking at, at the regulators, in this case, maybe banking regulators, and looking at the legislators that there are several stablecoin bills out there trying to be passed and going, I don't think you're going to upset us. You are not putting something in place that's going to knock down what we just did. We control too much money. And by the way, we're coming up on an election year and you don't want to piss us off. Same thing BlackRock is doing, right, is we're coming up on an election year. We're going to get this ETF approved, whether you like it or not. And if you're not going to approve it, we're going to put someone else in there that is because we have enough money to do so. So it's interesting to both PayPal and BlackRock doing this coming up on an election year, and they're going to, going to get to control a lot. So I think this is just as much, if not more important from a regulatory perspective as what BlackRock did, because stable coins are going to be very important in the usage of the ecosystem. Something else to point out is it's built on Ethereum that you can imagine the number of transactions now that are going to happen. If, ever, if there are what, 430 million PayPal accounts in the world, I don't know how much is transacted on PayPal. I think it's like $29 billion a month or something like that. If all that gets transacted or a piece of that gets transacted on Ethereum, and that translates to the price of ETH, you can see the price of ETH shooting up. 
right? I'm not saying it is, I'm not making that call, but I can see that happening. If we do want to delve into a little bit of the negative of the story, it is the fact that PayPal has been notorious for shutting people's bank accounts down for, for no reason, shutting people's PayPal accounts down for no reason. And people just, you know, have money stuck in their PayPal account and they can't do anything with it. Keep in mind when they issued this stable coin, according to the New York Department of Financial Services, there's code in there that says, if I have PayPal USD in my wallet and PayPal thinks I'm doing something bad or nefarious or negative, they can actually shut down my tokens so they can make my tokens not able to be used anymore. Okay, so that is a little bit of a negative and PayPal has had that experience before of shutting down people's accounts. So that's a little worrisome. Plus the fact that they're making this, you know, a, a compliant stable coin means that if New York or the US government says, hey, PayPal, you need to shut down Adam's coins, they can do it. And they have to, right? So if we want to delve a little bit in the negative, there it is. But on the positive side, 430 million people are going to be able to onboard into a stable coin without having to do anything else, without having to connect to a bank or anything by virtue of the fact that they have a PayPal account, which means, Medi, if you buy something from me using dollars, I now have dollars that I can convert to PayPal USD, take it out of PayPal, and I now have you know, an Ethereum based token in a crypto wallet that I didn't have to go to a bank to get. And and Adam, I just want to also add to your one negative. There's a lot of people out there that would probably see that as a positive, right? And the fact that they're seeing it as having some sort of structure around nefarious activities and such, which weirdly, I think gives a lot of people, especially the older generation, a little bit more comfort that there is actually some sort of guardrail against right misuse or, or you know bad intent malintent and such so you know 50 50 i just i come out seeing all positives mate i'm, I'm a glass half full kind of guy like so. overall i think it's great when i was giving you the negatives i'm giving you the negatives from the super pure crypto perspective this pure decentralization perspective but you're right in order for crypto DeFi, whatever to work even if it's baby steps it has to be something where we can we can make sure that North Korea isn't jumping into to some pool with 100 million PayPal USD or something. We we still have to make sure of that. We still have to make sure that I'm not laundering money, all of those things. And if this is what's going to make more people in Congress, more older people, more people in traditional finance feel better about it, and, and it spurs the, the crypto ecosystem along, I'm all for it. Perfect. And that was no dig against our elderly viewers. I put myself in that same category as well. So we're all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. um, another piece of interesting launch, which was actually today, is uh, Coinbase's uh, base, which is their layer two blockchain, um, has launched today. So we've got yeah. another another positive out today. Exciting. And, you know, Coinbase, I, I think, had their earnings, what, last week, I think it was. And so much of their earnings now is not from transaction fees, which it was years ago. And this is Coinbase's move, kind of like what PayPal is doing and seeing themselves differently and going, we're not going to go with the same old revenue models, same old business models. Coinbase is saying, OK, we're earning a lot of our fees from staking. People can stake their ETH and we earn some fees from that. And now they're going, look, we're just going to release this layer two. And a layer two is on top of Ethereum. It makes everything faster and less expensive. And so Coinbase has, has officially launched it as of today. So builders, developers are building applications on top of that such that I can transact more quickly and more inexpensively. And that's really what we need. Ethereum itself is too slow. So we have to build these layer twos that are going to take on the transactions and, and just make them faster and less expensive. And Coinbase announced this months ago. It's officially launching today. And again, the interesting part is companies like Coinbase and PayPal going, we see we see our business model as being different and we see our revenue streams as being different. And we're going to move towards that technology. We're not going to, to dig our heels in with the old technology. That's fantastic. It's all very exciting. And, and before we wrap... Let's, we've got another exciting situation in a very not exciting industry. Uh, insurance. Everyone hates insurance. Everyone knows it's a necessity in life. But it's also an industry that's needed a massive overhaul and a shake-up uh, for many, many years because it feels like it's been – it's not necessarily working the way it right. should. And there's a lot more changes that can be done. Talk to us about uh, – uh, was it Nexus Mutual? Um, in yeah, the right. Nexus Mutual, 
Right. I, I love Nexus Mutual. I, I have uh, quite a few friends over there. When I saw this story, I was really excited because what it is, is Nexus Mutual has been offering what we call on-chain insurance for several years, which means I can insure. If I put my money into a protocol, if I'm if I'm borrowing money or I'm lending money to a protocol and earning my four or five percent, I can use Nexus Mutual insurance or Nexus Mutual cover. It's technically cover because they can't call it insurance because insurance is overly regulated. They call it, in, I can use cover that says, if that protocol gets hacked or exploited, I can be made whole. And they've done this in a decentralized way where Nexus has said, here's the technology that allows you to create these pools of money that are going to insure people like Adam, such that if he gets hurt, you know, if, if it, not if he gets hurt physically, if his money is lost due to a hack or exploit or something else, we can make him whole. And those that money came from different people connecting their wallets and putting money in that pool. And they earn revenue as long as that protocol doesn't get exploited or hacked. So it's taking the idea of how insurance companies work, which is pooling risk and going, we're going to let anyone put their money in and pool their risk. And we're going to give them the tools to do so. Well, now what they've done, which is really exciting, is they've gone to a, a company in the UK that insures small retail businesses for you know small amounts of money and said, look, we have these pools of money. If you want us to also be your backstop, you can pay us some and we can allow this pool to be your backstop. Now, keep in mind, this wasn't Nexus Mutual's decision. This was one of the uh, pool operators that call a pool delegate. This is one of the pool operators that created this and said, look, we're OK doing this. We're OK taking that risk, that off chain risk from these retail companies such that if they have you know, a, a large claim that goes above and beyond what they can get from the insurance company, we can be the backstop for that. This is really exciting and important. It's not a tremendous amount of money. It's not a huge announcement, but I think it's really important in terms of uh, of understanding where capital is going to come from for industries like insurance. And now what we see is capital can come from different places. People are okay with earning yield, providing, uh, providing capital to, to backstop insurance. Right. And not only are they okay with it, but we've never had the opportunity to do that. I've never had the opportunity to participate in the growth of capital pools at insurance companies. Like you said, they become they become bloated. The premiums are really high. They don't cover everything we want them to cover. And Nexus is basically eating into that and saying, now we're we're giving that back. We're saying, look, now you can have smaller coverages. You can cover smaller amounts of people. You don't have to have this monster pool anymore because we can help backstop some of that. It's really exciting. And if you want, if, if I'm not going to go super in depth, but now if you go, okay, now we have on-chain ability to create insurance pools that are going to that, that are going to insure off-chain items. Now those on-chain insurance pools can go earn money. They can go earn yield with, you know, through treasuries. They can go earn yield on-chain. They can go earn yield in other ways. And this is really exciting. Like this, I know insurance seems like really boring. I've been super excited about what decentralization can do for insurance for years, and now it's really starting to happen. That's phenomenal. It's it's, it's it is very exciting to see how the evolution of these different industries can happen for the new use of this technology. And yeah. as you say, it's kind of democratizing the investment process for Joe Blogs to be able to get involved in something which has historically been an institutional play. So exactly. Yeah. And look, for any anyone who's watching this and is interested in, in kind of how Nexus Mutual works or DeFi insurance works on my YouTube channel, you can just search insurance or something. And I have a few videos explaining how this works, how the capital pool is working. Well, that's perfect, Adam. And thank you for your time today. I appreciate your thoughts on the topics of du jour. Oh, you're welcome, Matty. Glad to be here. And as Adam mentioned, don't forget, you can check out his courses as well on digital assets and crypto education. There's interaxis.io down there. Check it out and check out the YouTube channel for Adam because he's obviously got a lot more topics that he covers within that universe as well. Of course, don't forget to subscribe and like to your finance TV. Get it done. And we'll be back next week with more on crypto assets. Looking forward to it. Adam, thanks again. And everyone, good luck investing.